Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight for this um, for this webinar on improving farm dam water quality for productivity and biodiversity. Um, we've got a we've got a few people still joining. Um, so as we get underway, um, I'll just give you a bit of background information and some housekeeping before we do introductions. Um, so before anything else, I, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we're all calling in from. I am on Anawan land and pay my respects to Elders past and present and to any First Nations people on the webinar this evening. My name is Carl Anderson and I'm an agronomist with the Sustainable Ag Team based in Armidale in the Northern Tablelands for the local land services. We also have Sarah Payton here, our Graduate Advisory Officer with us tonight. The webinar that we're about to um, enjoy is occurring on the back of a project that Deb, Dr. Deb Bauer and Dr. Eric Nordberg are running at UNE, looking at the preferences, the production benefits and ecological benefits of providing good quality water on farm. There's just been two papers globally that have ever looked at the production benefits in extensive grazing systems, and those are from Canada around 20 years ago. Um, there is now more attention being paid to the area, and so we're really lucky in the Northern Tablelands to have them doing this research that's been really lacking from production systems and tying it in with environmental benefits. Um, I'll also mention that we do have some funding available to assist people considering implementing some on-ground works around alternative water supplies on farm in the Northern Tablelands. So if you'd like to, if you're interested in that, you can go to our website, lls.nsw.gov.au, um, select our region, the Northern Tablelands, <laughs> the grants and funding section. Uh, we have tried to advertise, ad, advertise it as much as we can, um, and it's now closing on Friday, so if you have any questions, do get in touch with me. Now, a little bit of housekeeping before we get underway. Um, we'll have presentations from Eric and Deb, Gordon and then Nigel, around about 15 minutes and then, and then some time for questions at the end. Um, in your um, go to setup, you'll see the control panel should be in the top right um, of your of your screen. There's a red arrow there on the button which collapses and reinstates the control panel. Um, there's a section there for any questions that you might like to, to ask and we'll, we'll give those to the panel at the end. And your questions just come to us that other people can't see them. So just, um, yeah, feel free. Um, we also have in the download section, the presentations that you could download yourself if you'd like to. Um, and you should be able to hear all of us clearly, hopefully, and but um, we won't we won't be able to hear you. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, um, and it will become available in a few days, and should get emailed out to you. As we just as we start, we do have a couple of um, of poll questions that we just like to get um, uh, get your impact uh, input from. So I'm just launching those now, and hopefully that's coming up for you. So if you'd just like to answer those questions, please. Okay, looks like we've got a good amount responding. Okay, um, and I'll just do the second one as well.
Okay, so a little bit longer. Okay, thanks very much for those um, responses. It's very useful for us to have a look at. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our panelists to you. Eric Nordberg, as I mentioned, Deb Gordon and Nigel Brown. Eric is a lecturer at the University of New England whose research focuses on the response wildlife have to landscape disturbances. He's especially interested in identifying ways to improve biodiversity on industry land, such as grazing and renewable energy. Deb is a senior lecturer in zoology and ecology at UNE. Her research focuses on conservation biology of threatened ecosystems and species, primarily wetlands, reptiles and amphibians. Gordon owns Eastlake, a 1200 hectare property 20 k southeast of Urala. He's worked on or managed Eastlake since 1971 and now is leasing it to a neighbour for grass fattening of yearling cattle. Gordon recently received the New England Region Individual Land Care Award. He's still involved in some management decisions with the lease as well as doing capital improvements, um, water, fencing, tree planting, etc. Gordon has a strong and continuing interest in ag education. And Nigel Brown, our vet in Glen Innes, who's lived and worked in 23 countries, including the arid parts of Middle East and Mongolia, where every drop of water counts. He's told me that he has practical experience of riding horses and camels in deserts where they just couldn't stomach the local water and where the adults and children develop kidney and bladder stones from low water quality. And his own whiskey was undrinkable when he added well water. So, a range of experience. Um, now, I'd like to um, pass now to Eric, who will um, do his presentation. First te technical hiccup. <laughs> there we go, Eric. There we go. Over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Just hang with us for a second while we get this up and running. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the uh, PowerPoint slides now. So um, I'd just like to say thanks again uh, for stepping in and listening to this. Um, I'm going to kick things off a bit, uh, just talk, talking a bit about uh, different land uses, um, and then I will pass it over to Deb, who will um, talk a little bit more about the, the research that we're doing. So global land use um, is obviously diminishing, and the amount of uh, land that we have on, on Earth is constantly getting smaller and smaller. Um, mainly due to population growth, and so our natural areas are constantly in decline. So we would all love to see more of, of these types of images around the place, uh, large natural and wild landscapes. Um, these are home to a variety of different species, um, but what we're really seeing more and more is kind of this type of an image where we have this interface between uh, people in nature, where we're, we're taking certain land types and modifying them for our own particular needs, whether that's agriculture, um, building roads, developments, um, housing, um, and things like that. And so these modified natural landscapes um, continually change uh, depending on what we're um, interested in, in doing with those landscapes. And this basically goes from coast to coast all across the world. Um, until we're basically ending up in an, a more urbanized world uh, where us as humans are basically the, the ones that benefit from that type of a landscape. Um, and this can be quite difficult for any other species uh, to really thrive in, it, in, in an environment uh, such as that, as you might imagine. So these environmental disturbances, they are basically uh, human practices that affect the natural environment. And so that could be from uh, a variety of different uh, pathways from habitat fragmentation, uh, where we're breaking up large contiguous chunks of landscape uh, by putting in roads, um, housing developments, and things like that. Uh, could be from the suppression of wildfires or even uh, an incre increase in grazing pressure. So all of these types of things have uh, impacts on what species we find, uh, where they are found, 
the different number of different species that we find, their species richness um, and their overall diversity of what animals uh, and, and plants that we can find in these ecosystems. So what can we really do about this? Um, how do we balance nature conservation and human populations? Uh, so there's, there's kind of two major uh, pathways here that I'll talk about. Um, the first being land sparing and the second land sharing. And so when we look at land sparing, uh, this is generally um, areas that we have designated as natural habitat um, and other areas that we have designated um, as some kind of uh, industry use or uh, farmland or things like that. So there are benefits to both of these. Um, in areas that are designated natural habitats, um, this might be something like a nature preserve or a national park. We generally get high species diversity, so lots of wildlife can be found in these areas. And similarly, uh, where we uh, highly modify some of these landscapes for farming, say, um, we can get really high productivity um, out of those landscapes as well. But they're mutually exclusive and we have a very limited amount of land to uh, divvy up between these two things. Um, and that's not necessarily always split 50-50. So in a land sharing situation, uh, we generally have um, these kind of wildlife friendly farming areas where we try and incorporate both of these things into the same landscape. So we might have areas that are used for um, grazing or other agricultural practices, but in between there we have uh, maybe creeks and rivers with buffers um, around them with natural vegetation um, and areas that other native, native wildlife can actually survive in these kind of mixed matrices. And so uh, we do have um, a moderate species diversity that can be found in farmlands. Um, we do get moderate productivity. Um, and the benefit here is that we can cover large swaths of land uh, by trying to incorporate both wildlife uh, and, and farming in the same situation. So ultimately our goal here is really to find that balance between land sparing and sharing. Um, so again, sparing where we're finding areas that has, have high intensity farming um, and those are highly modified landscapes, but we may want to uh, save uh, particular chunks of important habitat um, that are completely left for nature conservation compared to sharing where we might have a mixed mosaic uh, where we, we basically can have both of those things running simultaneously. And so national parks is one perfect example of, of land sparing, uh, but there's less than about 10% of the land uh, in Australia that is designated as protective areas. So if you look at this map here, all the dark green areas are national parks, um, nature preserves and things like that. They're extremely important and they do house lots of valuable uh, species that may not be found anywhere else. Uh, but the key thing is that if we look at this map um, and we, we look at it in a different scape, um, so here those dark green areas are now kind of this uh, dark orange color. So these are still all the, the nature preserves and national parks. But what I really wanna draw your attention to is this kind of light beige color, which is area designated for, uh, for livestock grazing. And you can see there's an enormous amount of landscape that is used for, for some kind of grazing practice, um, and it greatly outnumbers um, the land area that is used for, um, for sparing. So in terms of livestock grazing, <clears throat> most of you would know this, but grazing by livestock is probably about 25% of the, of the world's uh, land surface. And especially here in Australia, about 56% um, of our area is grazed to some capacity, um, compared to only about 6.5% um, of areas that are used for national parks and nature conservation. So what that really tells us is that rangelands have a really high potential for conservation. Um, given their large land area, we can, if we can come up with ways to manage wildlife and livestock simultaneously, uh, rather than basically having only 6% of the land that we can protect wildlife from, we're now you know, increasing that tenfold to almost 60% of the land area that we can now have some kind of uh, natural uh, biodiversity and uh, management um, areas for. And so in the past, we've generally seen lots of studies that have compared grazing lands to non-grazing lands. So comparing a paddock to a, a national park or something like that. But this is generally um, uninformative because as most of you would probably recognize, a national park is of course gonna have more wildlife and more biodiversity uh, than an agricultural landscape. Um, but it's not like we're going to just all of a sudden not graze or change, you know, millions of people's uh, livelihoods just based on that. So what's more important is trying to figure out a way to manage um, grazing landscapes as a whole. So in the future, what we really want to do is, of course, stop uh, 
you know, habitat destruction in general, but we know that that's <clears throat> very unlikely to actually happen. So we want to continue maintaining national parks and protected areas because they do have great value, but we just need to know that they have very minimal capacity um, in terms of their land use. And so we should better focus on maintaining these shared landscapes um, by creating more eco-friendly practices as well as sustainable industries. And this can be done. Um, so our research lab has done lots of uh, work in North Queensland um, and has been able to show that you can have highly profitable um, cattle grazing enterprises while also supporting wildlife. Um, so you do find wildlife on grazing lands and if, as long as you're not flogging it, uh, you're taking care of the, the ecosystem um, and knowing when to give it a rest, um, the, the animals will follow um, and you can get a pretty biodiverse uh, area, even in areas that are um, used primarily for, for grazing practices. And so with that little background, I'll just pop over now and hand it over to Deb, who will talk about some of the work that we're doing. So I will just switch over. Thanks, Eric. So, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so Eric has uh, a background in looking at how productivity and biodiversity uh, can benefit each other and can be correlated. So when you have the high productivity, you have the high biodiversity in agricultural systems. And my background is primarily in fresh water. So I've worked in streams and wetlands um, and have a background with turtles and frogs and looking at how to protect wetlands. And one of the areas that I got interested in when I came to the tablelands was looking at the farm dams around us, which um, are very prevalent in the landscape. And so we started looking at, well, what are the production benefits from having a, a, a healthy dam, a dam with good water quality and lots of vegetation and having biodiversity in your dam? Why would that be useful for farmers. And as Carl mentioned, there's a couple of studies, uh, not much out there, but they did show in Canada that when you aerate the water, um, you can increase the weight gain in steers. Um, and you can do that by 9 to 10% over three months, just by adding air uh, to a trough. So increasing that, that water quality by putting in the air, so there's less algae, um, less bacteria and that water quality is, is better. They've also shown that uh, heifers that access clean water will gain weight 23% um, more than those that are directly accessing a pond. So a pond or a dam, you can imagine that cattle with their big heavy hooves will walk in and I mean people will have seen it in their own properties, particularly um, during the drought, they damage the vegetation, so there's more turbidity in the dam, so much more sed sediment. Um, the water quality is much lower and it's dirty and the cattle don't want to drink it. So they've shown in a couple of studies that when given the choice of clean water, um, cattle will avoid the contaminated water and they'll spend more time drinking farm dams, ponds that have cleaner water. And when they drink more, they eat more. And so there is a direct production benefit. <laughs> There's also a water retention benefit to having higher quality in our farm dams. So when there's taller vegetation, it can reduce the surface area of evaporation from which wind can occur. It can cool down the water and help mix the warmer surface water to lower evaporation. So it can actually help keep water in a system when there's plants there to help um, to help shade them and uh, improve that water. There's a, a knock-on effect to water quality where macrophytes, so, so plants that are in the water and emergent vegetation, will help to remove phosphorus and nitrogen, those chemicals that cause eutrophication, so increased nutrients in the water which lead to algal blooms, they can help strip metals from the water 
and they can provide habitat to other plants and animals that are an important part of the carbon and, um, and nitrogen cycles. So things like turtles that we see all over the New England tablelands, turtles are like garbage cleaners. They'll, they'll go into our fresh waters, our streams and our wetlands, and they'll eat um, things as they die. And they can, they can reach really high density, so you can have lots and lots of turtles in one spot, and they can eat a lot of crab, helping to improve that water quality. And whereas fish really, really need um, dissolved oxygen in the water to breathe, turtles can breathe air. So they're really tolerant um, to all different types of conditions in fresh water um, and a really important resource to have. But a turtle needs food to eat, so it needs those bugs. Bugs live in the plants. And so it's a, it's a big cycle that helps each other. You also would have seen and heard frogs around, especially this season, and they're really useful for pest control. So in the rice paddies in southern New South Wales, um, frogs eat uh, pests of, um, of the rice, uh, and they can do this in massive densities. So anyone who's driven through Gyra lately, you can't, you can't drive down that highway without squashing about 200 frogs. Um, they're absolutely everywhere because they've had a good breeding season. And each one of those frogs is out there eating the mosquitoes, eating the flies, eating all of the little pests that get out there and cause nuisance. So they're handy little things to have around. So we've been looking at the effect of different management practices on the quality of these farm dams. And some people have fenced off their dams to reduce the damage from direct access from the livestock. And that, of course, will encourage vegetation growth and some of the things that I've talked about. Um, but some people don't want to fence off their dam. You know, they want that backup um, for if the trough fails or um, they, for whatever reason, they want to have it there. They want to have it there so the cattle can go for a swim or so that the uh, sheep can access it when they need to. And so we're also looking at, well, if you have an option for a trough, but you also have a dam, what proportion of the time do the livestock go into the dam and how much damage do they do and under what conditions? So one of the properties we're looking at has a, has a two-day rotation, so a lot of livestock go in for a very short period of time and then they move on. Um, and other properties that we're working on have uh, much less, uh, so the livestock spend a lot longer in the paddocks but at a much lower density. And we're looking at how with these different uh, types of approaches to, to managing the dams, what the difference is and what we see in terms of biodiversity, vegetation um, and water quality. So as part of our LLS research, we're working on um, property with fenced dams, unfenced dams with and without trucks. So that's Gordon's property and he'll talk to you soon. Um, and we're also working on a rotational raising property out of town. And so we're using a drone, um, you can see on the right here, this is a drone image um, to look at vegetation. The reason we use a drone instead of standard transects is you can see that it's really patchy and that if you did a transect in any one part of this dam, it would be difficult to capture the variation. There's just, there's a couple clumps of emergent vegetation in a few spots and you'd have to do a lot, a lot of transects before you capture that variation. So we can go out, take a drone, take a snap, um, be there, just circle on the image where the vegetation is, and then we can look at that change before and after the livestock come in. We're also using camera traps to look at the behavior of the cattle, so how much time they spend accessing the, uh, the dam when there's a trough and when there isn't. Um, how that influences the water quality. So we've got a water quality meter um, and we can look at nitrates and salinity and um, dissolved oxygen and so forth. And then doing biodiversity surveys. So what birds, um, what mammals, what frogs do we hear on those sites? So hopefully I'll have some results to, uh, to present back to you from the tablelands um, in time to come. But for now, I will say thank you and if anyone wants to contact me and talk farm dams, uh, put up my contact here, or you can go through Carl, and I'll pass over to Carl for his. Um
Oh, sorry. Oh, we're live now. Yep. <clears throat> yep. All right. Thank you, Deb. Um, Okay, Gordon, your your turn now. Um, hopefully you can see my see my screen, which is which is Gordon's title page there, LLS Farm Water Webinar. Right, um, thank you very much, Carl, um, and thank you for all the other presenters as well. Um, my name's Gordon Williams. Uh, we own the property East Lake, and you've got a bit of background. Um, and uh, I'll just jump straight into the slides, and that might leave for time for questions either. Uh, later on here or uh, afterwards if people would like to contact me. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a silt trap area uh, upstream of our large dam, which you can see just behind the bank of that. Um, it is a uh, biodiversity area with large numbers of uh, waterfowl, occasional white-bellied sea eagles or uh, brown falcons, and uh, obviously plenty of turtles. I'm sure Deb would find some. And uh, so it's actually a dual purpose thing access to keep the water cleaner into going into our big dam, as well as um, um, a biodiversity area for all sorts of wildlife. Next, thanks. <coughs> Next one, please. Right, um, <coughs> we have approximately eight kilometres of creek lines that run through East Lake, uh, and by the end of 2019, we only had our large dam, <clears throat> which you saw before, and two water holes right at the end of My High Creek on our northern boundary that had any stock water that was usable. We had another five dams with some stock water at about 15% capacity. Um, we did destock to about 20% in July 2019, and we destocked enough to um, hand feed other than some dry feed blocks, just with some wiener cattle. Um, that shows how uh, empty the uh, creek was. <clears throat> Key issues as I see them, uh, and it's just my view and things I've picked up from other people, plan and be proactive. Uh, seek advice for flow rate, that is, and pressures, pipe sizes, type of pipe for a particular season system, whether it needs to be high pressure or low pressure pipe. Um, every farm and situation is different with elevations, distances you might need to uh, transport water. So you can just get advice from any of irrigation type equipment pipe. They will look up their charts and give you very, very accurate information as long as you give them good distances and heights and pressures that you need. <clears throat> with dams, I think it's really important to ensure um, catchment ground cover is maintained to reduce filtration and thus and thus cost um, over time. Um, technology for monitoring, there's plenty of it about at the moment, but uh, my view is remember it's a tool to assist you, it is not a toy. Uh, if you like playing with uh, technology tools, that's great, but if you want to be efficient, make sure it's a tool. Uh, generally one larger dam or number of larger dams uh, with reticulated water is more efficient than many small ones for all sorts of reasons. Um, I'll just add there, I have no experience with bores. Next, please. <coughs> We've got a bit of uh, costs. Um, just in round figures, poly pipe is relatively cheap and it's important to use a larger size if you're in doubt as to what flow rate you need. Uh, which you should be able to get, but if you wish to extend that system. <coughs> Troughs, as probably most of you would know, around about $800. They should last at least 40 years, and depending on the quality of the concrete in the manufacture of the trough, 60, 70, 80 years is not unreasonable. <coughs> Always use good quality fittings, whether they're poly, brass, stainless, uh, or combinations. Um, the old egg poly, green line, it is cheaper. Um, but if you're advised, use higher pressure metric. If there is pressure issues of pumping up large heads, 
um, or for abrasion or in-ground strength. And I've been told that some rocky basalt soils, um, because they've got a high clay content, they move a lot and they can fracture pipes, which is more likely if you're using green egg poly. Pre-ripping, obviously recommended before laying pipe, so you don't have any surprises. And uh, really important, as Carl and others will mention, look to subsidies if they're there. Um, larger dams are generally better if possible in my view, and I think most people would agree if you've got them. This is an old diesel uh, <coughs> pump we use for our articulated supply or for our large dam, which was just below the original silt trap we showed you. Um, this old diesel pump, if it gives up, will be replaced with a solar system. Um, and just a few very rough estimates, we'll be looking at about $60,000 for panels, pump, underground high pressure pipe, because we've got to pump up, up about 46 metres of head to our reticulation point where we have turkey's nest. Then um, when we do that, we'll add, add a large tank, two to 300,000 litres, which uh, is around 25 thousand plus dollars just for that alone. Uh, so 60k all up. Um, and I will, in this case, put some monitoring technology onto the, um, uh, the pump and onto the, the new tank when and if it goes in. This is an old medium sized dam on the right. Uh, it was put in in the early 60s, so it's about 60 years old. It now needs the silting. It's got a, up to a metre right in the middle of the hole in front of the bank. Um, and it services three troughs, five paddocks, um, total of five paddocks for the troughs. And um, when we do that, we will add a biodiversity island within the dam by deepening the dam, creating an island. And uh, we'll also have to upgrade the uh, pipes through the bank by putting poly through it. <clears throat> really important, um, use filters for outlets to prevent trough float blockages. Um, I've had the odd crayfish get down into a, a trough and completely block it. Um, or you can get weeds or a little stone or a bit of a crayfish that will actually hold a float open and then that will create loss of water. This is one of our turkey's nest storages. Got a floating offtake filter. You might be able to see it just on the, uh, on the left. Um, and that's got a, a sieve on it as well. And the one on the right is um, another turkey's nest we have that has an outlet um, floating on the, um, on the left and on the right you can see the yellow um, float. Well that's an inlet from another smaller dam that we fill and act as a reservoir that's between the two turkeys nests. Next please. <coughs> um, header tanks I think are, in our system are a really important part and I think it's something that uh, people really should investigate. They act as reservoirs for at least, in our case, a day stock water past the point of where that tank is. Now, if you've got water going downhill and uphill, then over a hill, where you come to that rise, you can get air locks. Now you can get um, little devices to get the air out, but I just think it's a lot better if you can put a tank in. Um, this one on the left um, is in the, both are on the saddle in the landscape. So you place the tank at the lowest point along the saddle and at the highest point across the saddle. And you can do that by eye, it's pretty easy, or you can do it with a level if you need to. Um, the one on the left, four troughs of feeds and the next tank, and that initial tank is about 1.7 k's from the turkey's nest to which we pump. Uh, the one on the right, um, that's about a k further on from the one on the left. And uh, again, on the saddle, it feeds two troughs and we could uh, add a third or fourth drop to that if we needed, needed to. Thank you, Carl. <coughs> um, one thing we've started using um, round up troughs, we use old truck tires, very easy to get hold of, just turn up at the truck place and I love to get rid of them because it saves us the money. Um, we put old tires around this trough, um, was initially done just on a bed of um, gravel, a few inches thick, then we put the tires around, I just haven't got back to, um, filling them with, uh, with gravel, but as you can see, they're holding any dirt, getting a bit of grass growing and stabilising, particularly the downslope of that area. Thank you, Carl. <coughs> we do have a bit of a, a lag time here. Um, 
when we're putting these tyres down, just a simple thing I developed, we use pegs for the tyres, which are a third or could be a half steel post if you've got really deep soil. Um, and then welded onto that is a piece of 12 mil or 16 mil rod, um, welded on, as you can see, at an angle. Um, and that is just driven in and the uh, rod holds the bead of the tyre and holds it perfectly in place. You obviously put that on the higher side so the tyre is pulling against as it tries to move downhill. On the right, that trough's been done for about five, six years, five years now. Um, and uh, I haven't re graveled it in that time and now needs just a little bit of gravel on it and fill a few tyres up uh, to bring it back up to scratch again. Thank you. <coughs> A uh, few other considerations, um, if you do have good natural streams, consider the need to develop off-stream water points as has been discussed um, earlier. Much more efficient use of water and there's a lot of biodiverse, positive biodiversity soil conservation considerations. And I suppose the question I'll throw in uh, <clears throat> to people here in the audience, can, excuse me, can biodiversity be an additional positive for your system or farm. Now, we only have chain of ponds, high catchment ephemeral creeks, so we don't have a continuous water course, so we just need to adjust. But I think biodiversity is a win-win thing if you can incorporate it into your system. <clears throat> Plan and execute a water system over time if possible, because it can be costly, but it does spread that cost. Um, fail to plan, plan to fail, you all know that one. Um, I have no experience with bores, so I talk to someone else. Um, I believe it is a lot cheaper to pump and reticulate water than manage or clean numerous smaller dams. <clears throat> Haven't got any actual figures, but you get an excavator out at uh, $150 to $200 an hour. It doesn't take much to uh, add up. Um, it's been mentioned before, and Nigel will talk about it. Clean water leads to higher animal performance, animals have a better appetite, eat more, um, and you'll hear more about that. Muddy dams, we all know trap and kill livestock, but they don't drink enough water, so they just become unhealthy. Um, make use of government funding, as we've talked about. Um, I believe biodiversity, whether it's in your water system or across your farm in general, uh, as we've done in our place, has huge overall farm benefits. And so a planned water system may complement this biodiversity right across um, your farm. <clears throat> um, more troughs, I uh, just missed that one, but that's all right. Um, Carl's trying to keep ahead of me. Um, oh, that's right, what it was. If you have more troughs, it's in, particularly in drought time, it will stop livestock walking too much in a drought pan. Erosion or wind erosion issues. So how many troughs you need, each farm's different, whether you've got small paddocks with rotations or slightly larger, larger paddocks, um, just work out how many you need. Other considerations? Um, no, you're right, Carl. You're right, Carl, go on. <clears throat> um, Looks like we've just lost Gordon there. Apologies. Um, he did say that his connection can be a little bit erratic sometimes. Through to the dam, through the dam and onto the other side. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> Good. Um, for me, at least, yeah. we just missed uh, what you were talking about for that whole slide. Would you mind just repeating that, please? All right. <clears throat> Small fence dams can be very efficient. Uh, the grass here, 
filters the water coming into the dam because it, it's completely fenced. Um, you get more biodiversity within the dam um, because stock aren't bogging the edges. And on this sort of country, which is light, sodic, sedimentary trap country, the water just becomes like milk coffee. It just gets bogged, you know, just grey, brown, and then the edges start to creep in and in no time you've got to clean it out again, particularly if you've got any number of cattle on it. Um, this dam eventually will be part of a 65 metre wide by 450 metre long corridor of shelter for biodiversity, etc. From the timber you can see behind, which is just next door to a um, biodiversity conservation area of 72 hectares, it will come through that extra direct seeding or whatever done, some planting up to the dam, past the dam, and it will join on other vegetation um, that is currently um, on this side of the dam and then goes through a boundary fence where there's additional vegetation on the neighbour. And this is just an old trough below the dam, just a fairly low head, but very efficient use of that small amount of water. Thank you. <coughs> Um, this is just another fence dam on the left uh, with an older style trough below that's 35 or so years old. Um, but just remember, wildlife areas can also include foxes. So we occasionally get a fox digging a burrow at the back of the dam. We haven't got sheep now, but um, that is the sort of thing it can be an issue. And the extension of some trees and stuff either side of that um, dam on the left also acts as livestock shelter for shorn sheep or shade or whatever. Uh, thank you, Carl. <coughs> um, the troughs we use now um, all have fully enclosed float chambers um, with some sort of a lid on top. Uh, we always put a, uh, a ball cap um, coming into the trough so you can turn the trough off immediately if you need to for cleaning or fixing a repair or whatever or turning it off. Um, and certainly improves maintenance and uh, makes cleaning a lot easier. You can just turn it off, let your water out, give it a scrub out, turn the water on, flush it, put your tap in, your bung in and away you go again. Next please. <coughs> um, <coughs> thing we have put in in one spot where we've got um, <coughs> around about 40 metres of fall to this point here is a flushing tap. And then going up the other side, we've got around 20 metres of rise. So if you're going to get any siltation or debris, it will be at this lowest point, which is right in the bottom of a creek line. So we've got a flushing tap, pull the cover off, turn the tap on, you can flush any debris out. <coughs> and you'll see the old drenched container um, we use, but um, with a lump of rock on top. But now we're just going to, for any tap cover, anything new, ribbed plastic culvert pipe, 150, 250 across, a bit of old conveyor belt to um, fit in the top with a bag or something inside. And you can see we just cut a slot either side of the, um, the pipe, fold the edges out, put it over, and then that I just refilled. That was taken just before I refilled it with earth. And uh, yeah, very simple. Um, next, please. <coughs> <coughs> Um, older troughs, um, this is one that services two paddocks, so it's just in the fence line. Um, quite a lot of the older troughs get concrete cancer into them, either with water getting in and expanding with frost, or they start to rust in the, um, the reinforcing. Um, we've just mended that using a mixture of bondcrete and cement, and then we make up, if we need to build the edges up, um, we use bondcrete plus, well, that mixture, plus some extra sand and cement to make a mortar or sticky sort of uh, putty that you can actually build the edge up. And uh, once it's set, throw a bag over it to keep it moist for a few days, um, sucking the water over the, the trough and uh, it'll be virtually there forever. Next, please. <coughs> there we go. Uh, this is just another newer trough we put in right towards the end of the drought. Again, services to paddocks. Um, and I picked up this idea from someone else, a um, pipe across the top, collar on each end, slide over two maxi steels, and then you can strain the fence up to the trough for the lower wires, 
and the wires above just run straight across the trough. So that's some um, idea I picked up from someone else. Next, please. Um, just some conclusions. Um, I was, uh, we were very fortunate that my father had the foresight to build the large dam after the 1965 drought. You'd probably never be allowed to build it now with regulations. Um, but we've made the most of that as part of an integrated water system for Eastlake. And as I mentioned before, the vast majority of information has come from others' experiences that we have adapted. And it, I think it's really important to adapt ideas and principles to suit yourself. Don't just adopt what someone else says, oh yeah, that'll work. Think about it. Um, and if anyone wants to ask me questions, that's fine, or contact me at my email, um, and uh, happy to uh, discuss further or show you around what we've done if it's any use on the property. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Gordon, for your, um, your insights and experiences over, over the years. Um, Nigel, now, just passing over to you. I can't get, I show my screen, here we are. Ah, it worked in rehearsal. It did work in rehearsal. Here it goes. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So good evening. Thank you very much indeed for um, staying on this long to hear my talk. I hope you have. Um, this is my subject tonight, water and grazing stock, although I did realise that in fact some of my um, um, uh, sort of slides might in fact be about uh, animals that weren't actually grazing at the time. What I wanted to state was that uh, water is an essentially nutrient. It makes up about 50 to 80 percent of the uh, body that in the live weight of our cattle. It's important, therefore, for both the welfare and business profitability that we get the water situation for our animals uh, as, 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 as optimal as we can. Although the amount and quality uh, required varies uh, between species, uh, even within the cattle species, with the environment and the uh, production stage. And I put my own little thoughts there on save water, uh, drink wine. I think we waste a lot of water. So I'll just raise my glass to you uh, and, and I'll drink it later. So if I now look at the six functions, critical functions of water in the body, just to give you some idea of where we're going, it's critical for gut and lung function. We all know that animals on a cold day, you can see all that condensation coming out with every breath with the steam and through the nostrils. We can see it coming out the backside um, in feces. We can see it coming out in the urine. Within the body, it's, it's really critical to have good water levels for chemical metabolism. So all those body reactions that are going on, water is a critical ingredient. It's also a major component, of course, of secretions such as milk and saliva, as well as the concept as conception and growth products. The little diagram I've got here shows where the salivary glands are in the head. And if you see there's much more uh, saliva required when cattle are eating roughage, than when they are eating grain. But basically, they are going to be producing that amount or producing that amount of saliva every day. So to be able to get that digestion, the lubrication of the food going down into the rest of the tract, they've got to be producing that, that, that amount of saliva. If they're dehydrated, they can't do so. I mentioned urine, obviously that's flushing out the waste products from the body. And then there's thermoregulation. 
we all know that on a hot day, animals are panting, you're sweating, you drink more water. It's the mechanism for cooling. So let's look at the rumen. Um, here we've got a, a little diagram on the left-hand side, which talks about the time it's ruminating, chewing the cud, as opposed to time grazing. I've got diagrams here to show that the um, uh, pH of water needs, oh, sorry, the pH in the rumen needs to be at these various levels. Uh, if it's between 6.2 to 7, um, then that's an ideal situation. If it's below 6.2, the fiber digesting bacteria slow down. And when it gets really acid at pH is below 5.4, those fiber digesting uh, bacteria basically are killed. The lactic acid bacteria increase, so they are creating that acidosis. And, and again, that is critical. And, and what's really fascinating for me is that the saliva that I mentioned in the previous slide has a buffering mechanism to help neutralize overproduction of acid in the rumen. But if the animal's dehydrated, there's less saliva, less buffering to actually neutralize the acid. And if we look at this little bed at the side, so I've got the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum sections. Here's the papillae in the rumen. You can tell the health of the rumen. But look at that. 15 to 20% of the weight of the animal is in that rumen. For cattle, that's 162 litres worth of water, whereas in sheep, it's 20 litres. But the abomasum still has 19 litres of fluid in it. Next Oh, let's press that button there and see if I can. Hang on, why is that not going? It went for the other slides. Oh, it's locked on me. <laughs> ah, there we go. So within the room, then you've got masses of bacteria, other organisms, yeasts, fungi, protozoa. They need to live in a liquid medium that means that there's water in it. Now let's look at how those work. If they are dried out, they rumen bacteria will die. I say bacteria loosely, meaning the microbes will die. Now look, here we got 10 to the 10th, between 10 to the 10th and 10 to the 20th per mil. So that's the volume 100 litres or more, flow rate out of there is five litres per hour. Those protein, those microbes are the protein that the cow is going to be eating. So if you haven't got a healthy, so that's 10 times 20 noughts on the top of it, something like that, vast, vast amounts. And that's critical. Let's go to the next one. Oh, 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 press that way. So the water sources for our livestock. Uh, here we've got sheep drinking from lovely clear water. The other side of the coin is this picture from a further afield that's just outside. People are same water the and the people are drinking this water, filth, health hazards, etc. So the network connection, let's just ignore that, are free water, water contained in the feedstuff, and obviously that will vary depending on whether you've got lush grass or whether you've got dry grass. And then water is actually produced as a byproduct of the metabolic um, uh, processes going in the body. So the suitability of water use depends on the quality of the water, as our earlier colleagues have, have mentioned, salinity, acidity, toxic elements, compounds, algae growth, the environment, so the surrounding air temperature and the diet comp and dry matter content, and then various factors, as we mentioned, uh, with regard to where the animals are. 
So salinity, and I'm not going to go into great depth to this, ladies and gentlemen. There are plenty of reference charts that would take 25 minutes just to read. Um, so you've got there with salinity is the proportion of dissolved salts. Generally, the surface water is low um, and uh, in, in um, salts or artesian or underground water, the in salinity increases through taste or increases the, the, the amount drunken because of the taste. Cattle have a wider range of acceptance in, with regard to taste than people, uh, but I, 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 I was driving, riding across Gobi, and our horses that started off at the northern edge of the desert, they could not hack the uh, salted water as we progressed into Gobi. And they were, they were losing weight rapidly, uh, so much so that we had to stop. And then we had to find some new horses that were used to that sort of water because they just wouldn't drink it. So we get upsets if the pH is outside of a a, a sort of a median range. It gives digestive upsets. They'll reject the water, loss of appetite, and thus loss of production. Water is an important source of minerals and salt, but they have to remember that you can reach toxic levels, particularly underground water. It can, in high concentrations, some of these will actually lower productivity. And some of those are pretty common things that you'd be talking about uh, if they're sluiced down into dams, let alone some of these more toxic uh, chemicals. Evaporated cooling, we mentioned that they prefer water at or below body temperature uh, and will actually um, avoid warm water if they possibly can. Evaporate, remember, if it's in a tank, it's going to increase the salinity, alter the pH and concentrate chemicals in it. Drought is going to force animals to, to eat more fibrous, less digest digestible feedstuff, which is, as we said, going to increase the water requirement. And here we are, typically, we know the effects of lush green pasture in spring and then dries out during the year. Heavily pregnant animals, lactating animals, um, with their, their intolerance of um, the, the um, saline water, weaner sheep, high salinity depresses growth rate and wool production. There are breed differences. A British sheep need about 20% more than Merino in hot weather. Um, Boss Indicus and their crosses drink less than Boss Taurus cattle in the hot weather. Animals can, however, become acclimatized. I've mentioned the Gobi horses, but the Romney Marsh in Kent in England is a level marshland that's held where the sea is held back by a sea wall and the Romney marsh breed there is specifically developed to evolve over years to cope with the higher level salinity. Now livestock watering points. Uh, really we I've run into lots of problems where livestock have been put into paddocks and they then cannot find watering plants pints when the the grass is so high so it needs to be shown them otherwise the poor buggers could die of, of dehydration they may avoid water where the surrounding areas are boggy and they will avoid if it's heavily contaminated uh, with suspended soil and feces interesting working in the middle east and certainly recently around uh, northern tablelands where people had sheep in feed lots for, for containment feeding for during the drought, just a fine layer of dust over clean water will stop sheep drinking. And what's interesting is that, that this can lead to kidney problems. I'll try and touch on that in a moment. I think I've got a few minutes left. The, normally sheep will graze within about 2.5 kilometers radius of water, double that for cattle, but 75% of cattle grazing is within 300 meters of water. And the radius decreases when the water requirements are increased. 
in the deserts flying over Saudi for looking for gazelles, we used to see a circle around where they had their water houses. It was absolutely phenomenal sight. That watering radius is actually something that I think is, is quite misunderstood or ignored. Here's a little table you can get at later on of consumption per day for different categories of stock. That's out of one of the DPI prime facts. So the effects of limited or poor quantity water. Limiting the availability depresses production. There's, as you heard, I think it was Deb said, there's relatively small numbers of, of, of things that have been are written about this. Um, so we all get, tend to go back to the same uh, original papers. So that's why you'll see the same things appearing. Um, but the quality meant affects all those things. One of the interesting things is that uh, the, the salts, if they're not flushed out by adequate water, if it's too high or not enough water, we get a lot of crystals form either in the kidneys or in the bladder where the salts crystallize out and then they damage the bladder that could lead to red water where they're bleeding the blood out it could cause stones which will physically block the passageway affects the males much worse than the females because the females have a short passage from the bladder to the outside the males have a much longer thinner one that goes all the way through that kinky s bend of the penis and that's where they uh, the stones get caught I, I i've seen people in the middle east with massive massive stones that they peed out sharp and jagged in all sorts of ways i hope i'm painting a picture for you Water testing should be a consideration in productivity, not all, but in some productivity. Now, I think it was Deb mentioned that cattle avoid water contaminated with 0 0.005, 0 0.05 grams per mil of water. Now, I did a bit of calculation and study somewhere. One cow going into a dam like this one on the left all day and actually defecating into a dam will contaminate 25,000 litres of water up to that 0 0.05 grams level. All right, Wilms put it, I'm sure he probably did the calculations as well, but that's not very much. And if you imagine a whole herd going in, that water soon becomes destructive to the animal's productivity. Here's various figures on livestock production um, by having the advantages of having clean water. The diagram here shows that uh, this is comparing uh, live weight gains from dam water versus trough water. The, the trough water is in the blue and if you look at this line here, this is the zero line all the way through, you can see how the blue is constantly taller from a trough than a dugout, just so long as that water is clean uh, at all categories of stock. So there's some figures, nine to 10% increased live weight gain over 90 days with the trough, increased grazing time by 12%, and even the carrying capacity is increased. If there's enough watering points so that animals are never uh, more than 300 meters from, from water. Very interesting figure. The effects on the pasture, I've almost reached to the end here. A grazing cow is obviously going to return 79% of its nitrogen, 66% of the phosphorus, and 92% of the potassium eaten. Now, if they're not more than 150 meters from the furthest pasture, the soil levels across the paddock are, are going to have all that return. But if they walk greater than 300 meters, then the soil um, potassium and, and phosphorus are going to be increased the closer they get to the water tank. It's the same with, um, with, with camps, we all know that. So what water, what are the diseases 
there's various coccidia and giardias and cryptosporidia and things like that that live in muddy water and, and overflows. There are parasites like liver fluke. There are viruses. Now that's an interesting one because even if they're in tanks, they can still be spread from one animal to another. But the whole, if the animal is going into the to mud all the time, you're going to get feet changes. And then there's those blue-green algae that we see in this bottom picture here that can be poisonous. And if you've ever seen a mob dead round the side of the dam or within a few meters of the dam because they've eaten that, you won't forget it. And, and somebody else was mentioning the, the poisoning of nitrates, fertilizers, pesticides that are, are sluiced down into the water. There are other problems with lack of water. Um, that one was taken not far out from Gleninus. This one was not, but the amount of rubbish and debris that can cause blockages. So mud pathogens, that's a measuring un unit, a cluster former unit for adult cattle, but only one unit if you're doing a test is, is steam significant for calves. You can clean out the, 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 the soil by alum to make it settle, or you can get rid of some of these coliforms using chlorine. And, and this does not seem, when it's brought down to a reasonable level, chlorinated water does not seem to kill off the bacteria in the uh, rumen. So there's a very quick race through. There are my take home messages, but I suppose 20% uh, improved performance with clean water, even in a good year, is really critical. As Carl said, there are grants available to help people to want to fence off dams, minimize all this contamination, along with all the biodiversity. But if we're looking purely from animal health and productivity, it certainly makes good sense. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Nigel. To good help. Uh, <laughs> um, now, Sarah, there's, a, there's been a couple of questions, a few questions coming um, for for Deb and Eric. Um, unfortunately, Deb's just had to duck off um, to prepare some field work for tomorrow. Um, so, Eric, um, there's a couple of questions coming in for you. Sarah, would you like to um, to address those, please? Yep. Um, so the first question is. Um, Eric, do you have any suggestions on the best fencing options for water points to get the best balance between wildlife access and livestock exclusion? Should we be avoiding the use of electric fencing, netting, ring lock fencing, etc.? And if so, what are the options you would recommend? Just muted there, Eric. Yeah, there we go. There we go, thanks. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, it kind of depends on where you're at and what wildlife you might have uh, in your particular area. Um, in terms of different types of fencing materials um, or design, um, most animals are fairly good um, at getting through fences, as you'd probably be aware. Um, having top uh, top line barbed fences uh, can be problematic for lots of wallabies and kangaroos. You'll see them hung up on the fences uh, trying to jump over. Um, but at the same time, if you have uh, the fully formed kind of chicken wire fencing along the bottom, um, that kind of keeps everything out um, unless they can jump clean over. Um, so although it might be good for keeping things like fox out, um, you're also gonna block things like turtles, um, bandicoots, small mammals, and things like that. Um, so unfortunately, there's no real good answer. Um, there have been some successful um, 
mitigation efforts in trying to make wildlife friendly passages. Um, so either um, sections where animals can duck underneath, and I'm sure most of you will have, have seen this at some stage, um, some burrowing animals and wombats and um, even wallabies and things will, will use the same area over and over again until they get a depression underneath um, even an enclosed fence. Um, but some people have also installed um, what they're calling wallaby fences. Um, so almost like a doggy door um, type style, kind of breakage in a fence line um, where basically animals can learn that they can actually access in and out of that um, without getting hung up. Um, but in terms of around watering points, um, again, I guess it kind of depends on, on what your interest is. If it's, if it's really excluding uh, livestock, um, and we've done some work up in, uh, in the Cape uh, trying to keep feral pigs out of uh, fence, uh, or out of wetlands, sorry. Um, and that obviously can be a huge issue because they're just brute force little tanks um, and they can really plow through lots of different types of fencing. Um, but again, the, the issue is then if you're keeping something as big um, and strong as a, as a pig out, then you're likely also excluding lots of wildlife. Um, so there's really no simple answer, I guess. Um, there are a few different uh, strategies, but again, it'll depend on what you're trying to keep out and also what you're trying to allow in. So I don't know if that's necessarily a, a good and succinct answer, but um, that's about as best I can do. Thank you. Um, there's also a question statement saying many farm dams are isolated within the landscape. Could you please make some comments on the importance of vegetation connectivity in terms of biodiversity within and around farm dams? Yeah, so connecting different chunks of habitat is obviously a very important aspect of a lot of um, these kind of fragmented landscapes. Uh, some animals are actually quite good at traversing across um, you know, unsuitable habitat. So even things uh, like the long neck turtles, um, I'm sure Deb, Deb would talk about, um, they can be found pretty far from wetlands and, and they do these uh, on ground, you know, land migrations between uh, farm dams and creek beds and can be found, you know, upwards of two kilometers away from a, a nearest watering point. Um, and so in some cases, some species are pretty good at, at being able to, to navigate some of those uh, kind of harsh landscapes. But having any kind of travel corridor, whether that's a, even a simple tree row, um, scattered bushes, uh, clumps of rocks between uh, different areas, uh, definitely help in trying to make an interconnected web of um, kind of passageways for, for lots of wildlife. Um, and so they can traverse relatively, uh, you know, unsuitable habitat, but you need to make sure that those um, those isolated chunks of habitat might actually um, kind of make at least a chain uh, type corridor for, for wildlife to be able to um, move more easily uh, rather than, than just risking it by going across a, you know, just a, a large paddock. Thank you. Um, regarding the encouragement of water plants in dams, is there a danger that the vegetation will dominate, dominate the surface area and reduce water quality? How can we determine the best happy medium? And what is the best way to control water plants to a manageable, manageable level whilst not contaminating the water with herbicides, et cetera? Yeah, so this um, would be a good question for Deb. Um, and I would recommend uh, contacting her with this. But um, just briefly, I think um, having a lot of vegetation in your water quality or in your uh, dams and water is not necessarily a bad thing. So that's going to cycle through a lot of those. Um, nutrients uh, out of the water. And so you can basically have uh, an extra bit of vegetation. Um, and as far as I know, cattle and sheep will, will eat some of that um, either out of the troughs or, or along the farm dams. Um, and so I don't necessarily think there's a, a risk to your, uh, to your livestock. Uh, but again, this is a good question. I'd recommend uh, sending Deb an email with that one. Thank you. Um, there's another question that's come in, um, might open the floor for this question. Uh, what is the best way to keep your troughs clean of algae? I'll just quickly add to that, um, related to the, to the question before, um, by having, uh, some plants 
in your troughs um, that can keep algae down because by having lots of uh, nutrients in the water, um, that's a perfect condition for, for algae to grow. So I know Deb has um, advocated for having some aquatic plants um, in your troughs um, to try and uh, absorb some of those extra nutrients. But um, either Gordon or Nigel might have some more advice on actually cleaning out uh, troughs. Well, my, my take on that, if you can hear me, is um, I see a trough getting uh, too many weeds in it or starting to get a bit discoloured. Um, most troughs have got a, well, certainly the new ones have got a bung in the end. You take that out, shovel the stuff out, turn the water back on, sweep it out a bit, and away you go. And if my observation is if cattle are drinking a lot out of the trough, you're tending to get fresh water in all the time, and that helps. The only other thing that um, I know some people in the past have used things like some Himalayan rock salt. I've only heard of that. Uh, maintain it helps with um, cleanliness of the water. Don't know whether it does, or um, maybe there's some other sort of fairly simple additive you can put in, but someone else might like to comment on that. <clears throat> yeah, Nigel here. I, 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 Copper sulfate is the, the classic uh, chemical to use. It's much safer to use with cattle than it is with sheep, um, especially when you've got other sources of, uh, of copper going into the animal through rations or what have you. Uh, it was a problem we ran into during the drought where people were labor, poor labor, they were tired, they were using chemicals rather than physically cleaning out, um, and then copper levels crept up in some of the rations they were eating because they were using grape mark, which had a lot of the copper sulfate where the, the grape growers um, had sprayed the grapes to keep down the, the rot, um, and we, died, we lost sheep from that. Um, but Yes, I think you're right in, in as much that using cleaning mechanism is is uh, is good, but copper sulfate will help to to get rid of some of those things. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here for Gordon. Uh, how easy or difficult has it been to see or evaluate the benefits to your livestock in terms of additional pasture consumption, weight gains, or health improvement? Well, that, <clears throat> that's a bit of a million dollar question. Um, I think there's enough evidence around from what's been just talked about today that says, you know, clean water keeps your livestock healthier. If you've got feed there, they leave more feed. If you haven't got feed there, well, the feed that's there, they will um, get more out of. That would be my take. So, um, um, yeah, you've only got to see lambs standing around a dirty water hole or dam you know, they just won't drink. Or as mentioned before, clean water in a uh, feedlot type situation, a uh, bit of dust on it, uh, they just won't drink it. And I've heard that a number of times. So really hard to actually, for me to evaluate, um, but I'm just um, basically gone on the information that's available. Clean water equals more production. And uh, I think the other important thing is going back to that other point, having sufficient troughs particularly in a drought time, so the cattle or sheep don't have to walk too far to water. So it saves energy within that system if you've got some shade, so cattle can go and sit in the shade and keep cooler. That's where the, maybe your biodiversity around your water areas or across the rest of your farm can have huge advantages. So it's a matter of horses for courses. Find out how many, work out yourself, how many water points you need and um, yeah, if you can stop cattle walking or sheep walking any distance, powdering up your country, um, there's going to be huge benefits. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, we certainly saw that that here that we were able to manage our paddocks, about 40 paddocks on 1,200 hectares. We we're able to manage. If, so if I may, and um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Gordon. I thought you might have finished. No, you're right. No, I was no, just right, going Nigel, to... Thank you. I was just going to say, I think one of the advantages um, of these systems is, is 
potentially to reduce evaporation. Uh, it, it, it would seem pretty self-evident that if there's no cover around, the, even the slightest breeze whistle, whistles across uh, dams and, and there's going to be a lot more loss of uh, water by evaporation. I think the moment you start fencing it off um, and then taking, pumping it out, um, there's a whole raft, of, if you'll pardon the word, of, of mechanisms to reduce the surface area for um, evaporation, which will conserve that water. And we all know how desperately we need to conserve water. Um, so there's a question here. Um, so Susan has a five meg fully fenced dam, which they reticulate water to troughs from. Um, the dam water is very smelly and has had two fish kills over the past five years. Would aeration devices help eliminate the anaerobic material at the bottom of the dam? Um, I'll have to uh, I'm say that, yeah. on that one. Yep, go for it. Um, yeah, some years ago, um, not long after we built our large dam, um, we had some trout put in there. I'm not a fisherman, but um, someone else put some in, and we had a lot of those fish die, and that's you know 500 megalitres. Um, so it's not like a five meg dam. Um, but the reason apparently when I investigated was as far as trout were concerned anyway, if in hot weather, if they get near the top of the dam, the water's too hot, they go down a bit, there's no aeration or very little, therefore they suffocate, they come up, they're too hot, so they die. So aeration obviously would help, I would assume, because it would mean the cooler water further down is actually getting moved and aerated. So no doubt you could do that with some sort of solar pump. And uh, I was only thinking um, after listening to people about um, aerating water um, going into troughs that down the track when we replace our um, open uh, turkey's nest type storages with a, a tank, um, there would be the opportunity to pump into that tank and then it would be replenished all the time, but there could be the opportunity to, to put an additional little solar powered pump that just kept you know, squirting a bit of water around in the tank and aerating it. So um, I'm sure there's plenty of other people who've got ideas. So over to you, Eric. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's exactly what I was going to say was um, it seems seems reasonable that that would be um, a major contributor to the, a fish kill. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say. Um, there's just one last question here um, for Nigel. What would your uh, recommendations be for copper sulfate with goats? Sorry, was that copper sulfate with goats? Yes. Yeah, they're pretty sensitive to it as well. I cannot recall off the top of my head exactly what, um, what the concentration would be. Um, it would then depend on how many goats we're talking about. I think that's something that um, I would much be much more happy if the people would contact me directly, um, and then I'll look into that tomorrow for them, um, and we can work out something that's going to suit their their requirements um, and the husbandry techniques they've got in. Uh, but yeah, they are m much more sensitive than cattle would be. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions for now. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, so we've gone over time and a few people have obviously had to leave, but most have actually stayed to this late hour, which um, I think is a real testament to our presenters tonight. Thanks to everyone for your participation, and I think we've had some great information. I hope you've all found it useful too. In future, we will look to share some of Deb and Eric's findings from their research and, um, and other management options that people are playing with. You'll receive an email shortly um, with a link to tonight's recording um, if you'd like to view it back or feel free to share that on with any friends and colleagues who might be interested as well. I would like to acknowledge our funding from the Federal Government's Future Drought Fund, which has contributed to some of the work that we're doing and to tonight's webinar. 
And an extra thank you to Eric, Deb, Gordon, and Nigel. Um, so good evening for now and until next time. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>